Craig Bruce Smith. Welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. A big fan of all your articles and podcasts on honor. Hey, well, thank you very much. I appreciate that. Well, you got a book out called American Honor, the creation of the nation's ideals during the revolutionary era. I love this book because it talks about the transformation of the concept of honor during the revolutionary era. And we're going to get to what that transformation looked like. But what what got you exploring this topic? Because it is very niche and you know, people don't really write about, or professors don't really write about honor anymore. Oh, and that's that's a great point. Let me start off by saying whenever you mention my book and the word love at the start, I'm, I'm really excited by that. But the, you're right. It is a topic that really isn't discussed, is certainly not in academia uh, much anymore. I mean, a number of your guests write on it, but it's, it's, it's relatively small. But I think... It, it has been dismissed as sort of a niche topic, but I don't think it actually is. So I've always been interested in the revolution and I've been interested in ethical questions. And I'm also interested in the causes of the, the revolution. And, and lots of recent historians have sort of gotten away from this. Um, they don't ask, you know, what caused the revolution or what resulted. In fact, some historians have concluded, well, there's nothing left to, to know. And I think that's a problem. The idea is I was always interested in ethical questions. And the idea was there was no ethical history of the revolution. There was no study that really looked at honor in the revolution. So where did I get interested in this? Probably I had to say it dates back to when I was an undergraduate in college. And round about the same time, three books came out. Joanne Freeman's Affairs of Honor, Caroline Cox's A Proper Sense of Honor, and Judith Ann Buskirk's uh, Generous Enemies. And they all talked about honor in, in different perspectives. And that's what really got me interested in it as a sort of, as, as a topic. And then going to graduate school is really my thinking was clarified. Bertram White Brown wrote Southern Honor. But what I really wanted to do is go back to this, this mindset of what caused the American Revolution, and then a new perspective on honor, which has been dismissed in many respects as something negative or toxic or elitist or racist or sexist? Yes, this is, the, I think it's really interesting what caused the revolution. Because we often think, like, well, you know, it was the, the Stamp Act, it was the sugar tax, it was the, you know, all those things. But like, and it's like taxation with their representation, but we'll get into this later. It was like, really, it wasn't those things as like, the colonials felt like the British were just snubbing them and they were upset yeah, about it. No, that. you're, you're ex- absolutely right. I mean, not to say that, you know, it wasn't taxation without representation and all these other issues. And, and they talk about them. They 100% do. But if you go back to the original primary sources, before they mention that, they're talking about honor. They're talking about how they feel slighted and that these were just manifestations of, of the slight. So it wasn't the money. It wasn't the tax in and of itself. It's what it, it, it's, it said. And honor and taxation have had a, a long history. And the fact if you're taxed without your say, the idea was you were the same as a conquered people. And therefore, you were uh, people inherently without honor. So I, I think it's, it's, this is a very valid point. All right. Well, well, we'll get into that some more. So let's start with about the transformation here. So before we get to what American honor became, what was the concept of honor like before the revolution? So like we're talking colonial days. Um, sure. what, what was the concept? And, and the concept of honor, is, is, as you know from, from all your work on this, is, is very old. And Amer- colonial honor was not that different from its European counterparts. So it's an Anglo-American concept, very much based on birth, very much the older style of honor as, as valor. Bravery is reputation, very much the public sort of component of, you know, that you, if you needed others to recognize your honor, very much a top down, uh, as is common in all monarchical systems. So there wasn't that much different from the American concept of honor and, and these, the English concept, and we'll say a colonial American. What's, one of the fundamental differences, though, if there, if you start to see sort of elements underlying what's going to happen is you don't have the as regimented a class system in the colonies as you do in England. Obviously, there are only a few titled aristocrats. And because of that, you start to see undercurrents of this and also lots of different religions and dissenting religious traditions that also play a role. But by and large, before the revolution, American or colonial American honor is is really not different from English honor. 
So when did the transformation start happening? Like when you look at the primary source documents, like when do you start seeing, like, well, first off, like what did it, it democratized is one thing. So like more people laid claim to honor. We can talk about some examples of that. But I mean, besides that, what were the other, what was the other change you start subtly seeing before the Revolutionary War? Now, what's interesting is when we look at people like specifically look at Benjamin Franklin, we see a change very early on, as early as the 1720s. For others, like George Washington, we only see a change round about the French and Indian War. By and large, for most Americans, you start to see a change around the French and Indian War era. But Franklin in the 1720s starts talking about a concept he calls ascending honor. And the idea being in a sort of monarchical, aristocratic, traditional system, you have honor based on your parents. So if your father is X, Y, Z, then you inherit uh, from there. Uh, Franklin reverses that. And this is largely because he, has, as he'll, he'll joke, he's the youngest son of the youngest son for five generations back. He was someone that would have been completely marginalized by honor. And he reverses this, the idea that honor is due to the person who behaves honorably, and in turn, the person who taught them to behave that way. So parents, teachers, what have you. And uh, he learns this from lots of sort of literature, particularly Joseph Addison's The Spectator, which has these sort of essays on morality and different sort of cultural aspects. And, And he feel, and also reading classical works like Plutarch's Lives, the idea that if you're low born, if you behave honorably, you can advance in society. And, and he uses this as a form of social mobility. Washington and, and others start viewing slights that they face by the, from the British during the French and Indian War as a real moment to see sort of a failing on the part of the British and Americans as very much advancing on their own and being equal and, and sort of the idea of fundamentally American as being something distinctive from, from British. Yeah, so it seems like Frank, the lives of Franklin and Washington are great examples. It's like Franklin started at the bottom and went up, you know, and then Washington, I think he had that more aristocratic idea of honor. But then he his transformation went from that to like, I mean, I guess you could say downward. It went down to like more democratic. So they kind of met at the middle. You're right. They both um, start from very different beginnings and they end up in roughly the same place by the end, which is, which is very interesting. So like you said, Franklin is very much coming from this mindset of honor as a form of social mobility. He's interested in virtue. He's interested in how this sort of behavior can help him make his way in the world. Washington does grow up in a more aristocratic framework. I mean, he's he's friends with the Fairfax family, who's one of the few titled families in the Americas. And he learns very much from the English model, the reputation, glory, duty, whereas Franklin is coming at it from more of a, a sort of ethical, virtuous standpoint. And they one has a martial tradition, one has more of an intellectual tradition. Uh, although Washington still has a very, very, very large intellectual side that's often dismissed. So they do, they do sort of end up in the same place, but it's different. What actually sends them is both these sort of personal realizations when they start recognizing sort of personal slights they're facing from the British are tied into larger sort of taxation policy issues. For instance, for Washington, it's being dismissed of, of lower rank pay of having British officers feel that they outrank colonial officers of higher, of higher rank. And Washington starts moving to this idea of advancement based on merit during the French and Indian War, whereas Franklin comes to this sort of realization a little bit later in for becoming a patriot. And it's really when he's in front of a Privy Council in 1774, and he's sort of publicly humiliated and, and, and loses all his status, that he finally starts to, to see what the British Empire has done in the same way that, that Washington has started to come to this conclusion. Yeah, that's another, you mentioned the, the idea of merit and Franklin's idea that you gain honor by acting virtuously and ethically. Because before they pre, sort of primordial honor, traditional honor that the British had and, and Europeans had, it was, you know, might made right, right? If you won, you had honor. If you were on top, you had honor. Didn't matter if you acted acted unethically, it didn't matter, right? Like if whoever won a yeah, duel, you, whoever won a duel, like didn't matter if they actually committed the wrong, if they won the duel, well, they're in the right. 
Yeah, and the idea with dueling, you just showed up, you you proves you have honor. And an honor is very much tied to this idea of victory on on the field. Franklin is is one that really starts reversing this and and a lot of it has to do with the connection of of honor and virtue, which um has always been complicated because how do you actually define these terms? And there's always been, no one's ever quite sure, even during their period. And there's all sorts of banding back and forth. Uh, during the book, I really, what I try to do is make the, the claim that honor and virtue by the revolutionary era are used ver- uh, basically synonymously. And what do they mean? They mean what we think of today is ethics. So when we think of behaving ethically, that's words like honor and virtue would have been used. The word ethics, unless you were talking about Aristotle, really wasn't used in early America until the 19th century. So what words were used? Honor and virtue. Now, virtue traditionally had more of a morality component, more more closely related to religion. Further north you go, virtue would take precedence. Further south you go, they become more synonymous. And Franklin was from originally a Puritan background, then spent most of his life in, in Quaker influenced Philadelphia. And he starts actually keeping a spreadsheet of his 13 different virtues. And he says, well, you can't become a virtuous person all at once. You have to master each one along the list. And so he'd put check marks how he behaved on any given day. Uh, the last one on, and he said the further down the list that were the harder they were to master. The last one, one of the last ones of the list was chastity. And his <laughs> interpretation of chastity was a little different. He said, you could have premarital sex. You could have an affair so long as no one found out. Therefore, no one's reputation was ruined. So he had s- more nuanced understanding. Yeah. Well, that's a very like honor, like traditional honor based idea of chastity. Yeah, very, very much so. Um, so Franklin in, is sort of advancing in, in some ways, but there is still a traditional element uh, uh, there. But his was very much going against the the concept of, of birth. So, yeah, that, I mean, I think we shouldn't understate like how big of a transformation this was because for, I mean, basically thousands of years, honor was this thing is by birth, by uh, victory in the battlefield. And then you have the Americans making it, uh, democratizing it and then making it sort of an inner inner virtue that you can sort of you can you can gain honor just by acting like a good person exactly that is that is a fundamental reversal and it, it's it's one that sounds very modern but it's it's something that's that's often dismissed at, at sort of in this in the 18th century but you're absolutely right that is exactly what's going on but what's interesting is so it's a very modern idea what they did was very radical. But as you talk about in the book, their inspiration for this new concept of honor, you can gain it through acting virtue. They, they, they basically look to the past, look to antiquity, ancient Rome, ancient Greece, to sort of make the case for that concept of honor. You're, you're right. Every Briton during the period felt that they were sort of the heirs to ancient Rome. And during the American Revolution, the the Americans in turn feel that they are the the better heirs to Rome than the British. And they are looking to classical scholarship, sort of stoicism. They're looking to history uh, of varying sorts, largely classical, but also looking at the sort of English history of looking at the Civil War and the Glorious Revolution. And they're very interested in sort of new sort of enlightened works, whether it's Locke, Montesquieu, Adam Smith, and they're looking at this new sort of moral philosophy and this new sort of political philosophy that 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 really puts a burden of a proper conduct even on on kings. And the idea if a king doesn't behave well, that they are they are failed in their behavior, then bonds are are, are broken. And and Montesquieu is 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 key here. He refers to that honor and despotism cannot exist together. So if the king is a despot, the king is a tyrant, therefore he cannot be honorable. Therefore you have no connection, no no bounds, no no duty to him anymore. And so besides these a lot of these colonials were self-educated, but the schools in America at the time like uh, you know, high. I mean, what would be considered a high school, but also mainly the colleges played a big role in this transformation of honor in America. Oh yeah, most Americans are not going to college. In fact, I think the numbers are roughly one in a thousand. Could be even more than that. Most Americans are not going to having higher education. 
However, if you look at sort of the signers of the Declaration of Independence, the signers of the Constitution, they are disproportionately college educated. And schools started, colleges started much earlier than they do today. The average age of, of admittance was roughly 16, could be younger. And they really functioned as, you know, you would learn history, your philosophy, all your, your standard texts, your Greek, your Latin, your French. But they were more than just centers of learning. They were about really creating a, a collective mindset. And it was about establishing behavior. So these sort of codes of honor, a sort of camaraderie would form within the, the students of a certain class or cohort, rules of behavior that regulated everything from uh, where people sat to when they could, who could they can consort with. And there was very much a sense of self-policing. Some schools would, would have very strict policies that they would enforce, but others were really policed by the students. And the idea was if the behavior of one person was flawed, it reflected on the honor of the students, which then reflected on the honor of the school. So the idea was, was instilled prior to the revolution in, in people that are going to be major leaders of the revolution, that the I, that behavior matters. And if one person fails, that's reflective of everyone. And this is a sense that really carries over to how the revolution is, is fought and carried out. Sort of that, you know, everyone must be, do their part. Everyone must behave in a certain way or else all could fail. And they're encountering the same sort of texts. They're, they're speaking the same sort of language. They're, they're growing up in the same sort of environment where honor matters. And that's why it really translates into this sort of world outside the ivory tower. Yeah. You, you highlight a lot of professors at several of these universities in America would write these, based their morality text and where they fleshed out this idea as the, the path to honor was virtue and ethics, basically. Exactly. So if you want to advance in the world, you have to behave well. And then that's going to vary greatly depending on, on, on who you, who you are or your interpretation. But if you have your, your leadership all basically learning something comparable, they're all using the same texts or, or comparable texts. So everyone's speaking the same way. And then they get in positions of leadership. And that's what, what helps to bring about this, this sort of really quick collective understanding where you have people meet for the first time at, you know, at the first Continental Congress. And, you know, within a short time, they're speaking of like mind and pledging sacred honor. It's not something that just, that just happened overnight. It's something they had, had grown up with. This is sort of a tangent, but uh, one, of the, one of the things I enjoyed talking about the school, the college stuff. And I think oftentimes people are like, oh, colleges are terrible. It's just like you highlight some of like the riots that happened at Harvard, <laughs> like pitchforks oh, yeah, and torches, and it was terrible. Oh, the thing is, you, you there were all these rules of behavior, sure, but the there was all sorts of, of, of you know, you think today of, of like, you know, pranks that they had nothing. My, my favorite is at the College of William and Mary in, in Williamsburg. There was actually a pitched battle with pistols between the students and the townies. <laughs> <laughs> and it was led by the professor of moral philosophy oh, man. who ultimately got fired over this. But it, it's, what's also interesting is Thomas, this, it's tough to, I can't pinpoint it, but this may have actually been Thomas Jefferson's like first week at school. So I don't know if he j sees it or just misses it, but he sh arrives right around the time of this, this sort of pitched battle where pistols get drawn on the future governor and it's... It's not an uncommon occurrence, right? Yeah, I think I think it's so. It's like a part of American history that I mean. Sometimes we gloss, we think it's we sort of nostalgize, like oh, they were just prim and proper. It's like no, they were pulling pistols on each other. At, right, you, know. you had to have rules and in, in like you should not break your teacher's windows. You know things right. like that. <laughs> well, okay, so let's get into so they the founders were developing sort of this collective sense of honor in different ways, but sort of they're speaking the same language. Let's get into specifics about where we start seeing affronts to personal honor leading to different founders to like saying like, we got to separate for Britain. So you, you mentioned Washington. Yes. He started feeling, he was a part of the, the British military. He was a leader there. And you say during the French and Indian war, that's when he starts sensing like these guys don't really think I'm one of them and they're sliding me. Yeah, exactly. He's He serves alongside the British military, but he, he doesn't have a king's commission. He's a colonial officer. So he's, he's colonel in the uh, 
starts off as a major, works up to a colonial colonel in the Virginia uh, militia, but he's dismissed. Uh, you have a, a British captain say, well, I outrank you because I'm, I have a King's commission. You actually at one point have a, an American who held, briefly held a, a King's commission, but actually sold it claiming, well, I once hold a King's commission. So therefore I outrank you. And, and all, and how it went in the British military, you bought your commission. If you wanted to be a major, you could buy it. And then if you wanted to leave, you could sell it. So where colonials are sort of slighted for, they don't have a formal military tradition and a formal training. Washington's doing is they're fighting alongside. Washington becomes famed for his involvement in, in what becomes to be known as Braddock's defeat. And he's saying, I'm fighting alongside. I'm risking my life. Our Virginia regiment's risking their lives. Why are we not treated the same? And he starts promoting within his own regiment based on merit as a reflection of this. And then after the war, he, he retires and he had been speculating very much in Western land grants, especially that would have been opened up after the French and Indian War. There were lands promised to, to officers. And now you have the proclamation which prevents Western expansion. You have taxation. But for what Washington really opens his eyes is he is uh, very much as many wealthy Americans had been importing many goods from, from British merchants. And when the taxes come about, these British merchants call in their debts, and Washington is shocked by this. And he views it as a matter of honor because the idea was, if you're asking me to pay now, you, you don't trust me. You don't believe that I'm going to pay. So if you had debts, as many people did, that was actually considered a good thing. That was considered an honorable thing because it meant people trusted you. They believed you would pay. Whereas now, when these debts are being called in, Washington is considering it that, well, we're not being treated as men of honor as not being trustworthy. And the same thing, he starts to link his own personal treatment by his, his creditors with how the British parliament is treating the American colonists, sort of this lack of honor being bestowed. So that's, that's for him. Whereas Franklin is in many ways was very pro British empire leading into the Stamp Act. In fact, uh, he's opposed to the Stamp Act, but he's trying to bring about ways to, to facilitate a, reconciliation. And where this all goes wrong, he tries to blame it all on, on the Massachusetts governor, who's Thomas Hutchinson. And he feels that, well, if Americans have a villain, they'll forgive British Parliament. So he manages to acquire some letters involving Hutchinson and his brother-in-law, who's the lieutenant governor, Andrew Oliver. And he publishes select pieces sort of out of context that make Hutchinson look really bad. And he, t he sends it to select leaders like the Adamses and says, don't publish it. And they publish it. And before long, he's brought up in front of this privy council. And there are duels fought over where this information came from. And Franklin's forced to admit, yes, I did reveal this. And the idea is breaking the bonds of private correspondence between gentlemen. And Franklin says, well, I did it to preserve the empire. But he is sort of, he's publicly shamed. He loses his sort of postmaster uh, title, and he really loses his way in the empire. There's no place for advancement for him anymore. And he says, I did this all for the sort of greater good. I did this to help the colonies reunite with the empire, and this is how I'm treated. And then he starts to come to this sense of, of how his personal wrong is tied into the greater wrong being committed by Britain. And that's an interesting connection because, you know, they could have just stated, well, this is a personal affront, has nothing to do with the, the colonies, but they made that connection somehow. Right. And, and this is what happens in, in many places. The idea that it's a po the policy is put in place and then these have implications on the individuals. And as all these individuals are feeling this in this personal way, they start to collectively identify with each other in a way that they hadn't before because the, the colonies really functioned in many ways as, as separate countries unto themselves. It, so at what point? So they, these guys had this sense of 
collective honor. Like this, not only is this an affront to me personally, what the British are doing, but it's a affront to us as colonists. It's col- yeah, because I say it, colonists. Yeah, colonists. Uh, colonists. Sorry, as, as colonists. Um, but when did everyone else in America start feeling that sense of national honor too? When did you start seeing that? Okay, so there's, I don't want to say it's straight national honor, but sort of a proto-nationalism, which maybe is too academic because right. there's not a nation yet, but right. we're speaking of sort of the, the honor of our country. And at first it could be, you know, the individual colony or what have you, but they start thinking collectively when we get to the boycotts of sort of British goods, whether it's from the Stamp Act or or the Tea Act, sort of uniting to resist British imports, to not purchase goods that are taxed. And that's when you really start getting this this collective idea. And that's also where you start really expanding the idea of honor. And, And women become crucial here. And women's involvement in boycotts also has them uh, labeled as, as having honor. And, and as women become sort of political, there's there's a share of honor to to go around. They're 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 part of this discussion. There's also women are very much sort of enforcers of honor and in, in sort of keeping men in line. And in fact, you have women that are refuse to be courted or marry men that that do not comply with this. But we start seeing, I mean, it starts building, but by 1774, there's very much a collective sense. It is sort of a a country of the country's honor. And that's really exhibited at the First Continental Congress in 1774, where they do pledge their sacred honor. Two years before the Declaration of Independence is going to, you know, pledge our lives, our fortunes, our sacred honor. And there's a sense of this by 1774. It's not necessarily as a nation, but it's, a, it's certainly a, a unified element of, of, of thinking. And it's based on this ethical concept of Americans are acting a certain way. Britain is not. Right. And I, I loved how you described what some of the manifestations of that sense of collective honor. This is kind of where we get the idea of, sort of Repub- Republican virtue. So in response to the different acts and and I guess you'd call them terror. I mean, they were just basically, it made it costly for Americans to import British goods. Like Americans took pride in like their simple, plain and simple clothing. Like the- Yeah, it was, the, it was the first time in history where labels didn't matter. So you're right. They, it's not, it wasn't even really about the money. And they're very clear about that, that the, you know, the duties on tea, negligible. The, the, the cost of tea was actually made cheaper, uh, involved things with monopolies and it's long and complicated. But it was wearing homespun clothing, ma- using local products made in America. That was a sign of honor. That was a sign of, look, we are embracing that we are equal to Britain. We, uh, if, at first it's, you know, we are all true born Britons, but then it, it, it becomes more about a sort of early sort of identity as America as something distinct and something in many ways superior by that point to the British. Right. I mean, I remember you, you, I've, I've read things about some of the founding fathers talking about how the, the Britons were a fet because of their fine clothing and their silks and all this stuff. And like, we are like the, the, the heirs of Sparta and Rome where we really embrace Roman virtue and, and temperance and frugality. And they, they kind of had a chip on their shoulder about it. Yeah, exactly. Britain became sort of the den of decadence, you know, the sort of there, they were, you know, the Nero esque Rome, whereas Americans sort of embraced the sort of the idea of Cincinnatus of you know or or Cato, the idea of the greater good of civic virtue of sacrificing for the good of the many. And so the start of the Revolutionary War had a, had a, I mean honor played a role in there too. When the American the Americans thought, well, yeah, we can now fight Britain because well they shot first. Exactly. And that's a big, still to this day, we don't know who shot first. I mean, there's, there's each side blames the other, but the idea, if you're thinking of, of philosophical ideas at that time, you have Vettel, the idea of like a sort of a, what becomes sort of just war, a defensive war is honorable. So if the British fired first, as Jefferson's going to say, they're, they're murderers. We have a duty to, to defend ourselves. They're killing their own people. And it's, it's very much cast in this way. And that's how also how the Continental Army is formed. And Washington's going to say he wants gentlemen, men of character with a proper sense of honor. So the idea that if you're a man of honor, it will translate into the military, that you will uh, abide by certain roles, you will have a certain standing, you will be, know how to 
command. And there, there are rules put in place governing the conduct of the army. And what's really interesting, we know the British army on paper is, is f- by far superior. And we know Americans suffer very tremendous losses, particularly, you know, in, in New York. But there starts to be an understanding and they, they actually look at sort of 18th century military texts about the idea that honor can be found not in victory, but in just behaving well. So if you lose, that's okay. As long as you did your, your duty and Washington starts adopting a sort of war of post, a defensive style, not risking the army. And he's comes to the conclusion of that it's dishonorable to needlessly risk your men pursuing sort of glory or a victory that is not likely. A- and he views honor in the preservation of the army, of the continuing uh, uh, of the revolution, rather than in trying to grasp victory on every field. Yeah, that was a big transformation too, because the beginning of the war, like those costly victories that Washington faced at the beginning, like he had, he was using that traditional sense of honor where you you charge in and you just put it all on the line and you go for the big victory, but they just got slaughtered because the British were, they were better. And New York was was actually Washington's very apprehensive about fighting there. It's actually the Congress that's sort of demanding, based on national honor, it has to be defended because if the Continental Army doesn't defend Americans, doesn't defend their own people, how are they any different than the British, even though it was militarily a complete nightmare? So this uh, sense of, this growing sense of, we'll call it proto-national honor, really fueled the Americans during the war in the first few years. But then like it kind of hit the slog where like there was a point where the Americans were on the precipice of losing. But then another guy felt a big slight of honor by Americans this time. And he decided to do something terrible, which uh, sort of galvanized the Americans. Let's talk about Benedict Arnold. Ah, uh, Benedict Arnold, America's greatest hero during the early years and the greatest villain ever since. Uh, so Arnold is a very interesting character. And, and he, as you know, he features prominently in the book because he's just so different in a lot of ways. Arnold has a, in, in my, my sense, an older understanding of honor. I, I define him as you know, sort of more of a viewing himself as a knight of old. You know, he's off at tournament. He has this older sense of, of victory as honor, of reputation as honor. And he starts off the war. Well, he first comes on the scene, actually, during the boycotts and resistance to British goods in the, the 1760s. He's actually smuggling, and he's uh, turned in by smuggling. And he, the person who turns him in was one of the members of his shipping crew. He publicly whips him to exact some revenge. Anyway, so he advances in, in the military and he's a proclaimed for, for victories and even defeats in, in sort of the northern theater. And you'd be hard pressed to find a better battlefield commander than Arnold. But he starts to get passed over for promotions, particularly by, by Congress. And, and Washington's always been adamant that there's a civilian control, civilian supremacy. His power comes from Congress, which derives its power from the people. And Arnold isn't a good politician. He's brash. He's arrogant. He thinks he's the greatest general in the army, and he tells everyone so. And he he gets passed over. At the one moment, his great moment is the Battle of Saratoga, where he's actually uh, dismissed from the field by General Horatio Gates, sort of this rivalry. But Arnold defies orders, rushes into battle, and according to him, single-handedly writes uh, a potential defeat into, into a victory. And he's wounded on the battlefield. He's shot in the leg, horse falls on top of him, and he actually recalls being carried off by, by soldiers from the field. And he actually says, I, I wish the shot had been through my heart, sort of this glorious end. But he keeps getting passed over by the middle part of the war. His disputes with Congress are growing to such a point that they make him take an oath of loyalty before he becomes a sort of military governor in Philadelphia. And things get really bad. He throws himself a party to celebrate his new appointment, and he manages not to invite any Continental Army officers, invites a bunch of loyalist ladies, marries into a loyalist family. He's charged with all sorts of misappropriations of funds and equipment. And ultimately, 
he is Washington's forced to give him a rather minor reprimand. Just it's it's very light when you when you see it. Uh, sort of well, we we wish that Arnold had not engaged in such and such behavior, and there are rumblings about Arnold. People keep dismissing them. They're saying, "Well, look what Arnold's given us. How could we? How could we question him?" But it's that moment, this reprimand from Washington, who he viewed as sort of the one who is always on his side, uh, that really sends him over. And he starts a, a correspondence with the British through Major John Andre, that where he ultimately comes to turn over West Point in exchange for money and a British commission, and. To the modern year, you would say, well, this is selling out. And, and, but Arnold didn't view it that way. He viewed it as Americans had betrayed him, had not allowed him to advance, had treated him with dishonor. And it wasn't about the money. In fact, he takes a lower rank in the British army. Well, to show, well, this isn't about rank. It's not about status. It's about honor. Ultimately, the plan comes to nothing, but it's a great moment in that. There's lots of infighting by this point between the Continental Army and the the civilians over who is is why is this war not being won? The military says it's because civilians are are profiteering. The civilians say, well, the army's just not winning. But this is the moment Arnold's treason sort of snaps everyone back into this idea, this collective sense of we have to do what's best for the nation, and Washington uses it as such, and and he says, look how look how honorable we are. That this has only happened once and how lost, how unethical are the British that they have to resort to such tactics. Yeah. I guess thanks to Arnold, we won the Revolutionary War in a way. Oh, at least right. in part. <laughs> well, so Americans win. They they get – and that was a big deal. They And the way they, they claimed their victory too had a lot to do with honor as well. Like they wanted, what was it? Peace without peace with honor, or what was the the phrase? Yeah, exactly. That's a phrase that comes up time and time again. No, you know, or other versions. No peace without honor. Peace with honor. That it wasn't enough to just end the war. It had to be done while recognizing American independence. It wasn't peace itself w- was not an appropriate end if it didn't come with the freedom that was necessary to guarantee a lasting peace. So after the war, we, there was this, the founders had this, we had this sort of collective sense of honor. You talk about a group of veterans who's formed a group, it's basically a veterans group called the Society of Cincinnati, but there's a lot of controversy around this group and it had again, had to do again with honor. Can you tell a little bit about that? Sure. The Society of Cincinnati is still around today. It was and and still is a ancestral group of officers from the Continental Army and the French Army. So it was sort of a veterans association slash veterans benevolent association allowed to sort of care for the the sort of each other, brotherhood, sort of widows and children, sort of a charitable fund in some ways. But the the ways to advance in it is you either had to fight as an officer in, in the French or, or Continental Armies, or you had to be the firstborn son of one who did. And that's the point that unnerved many in American society that saw this as a new sort of aristocracy or, or the rumblings of a new aristocracy. So Wash, uh, so so Franklin, Jefferson, Adams, they all dismissed this as, I think as Franklin refers to them as an order of hereditary knights. Washington has made the initial president general. Hamilton's involved, Henry Knox. They don't see a problem with it. In fact, the, the Cincinnati is, is pledges to defend and support national honor. They they view this as well. We haven't we proved ourselves? We've we've Washington literally surrendered his commission. He could have been a king. The Continental Army peacefully disbands. There was a, a moment of tension during the the Newburgh conspiracy where there was a, a a fear of a potential mutiny against Congress, but Washington put it down, largely appealing to sense of honor of sort of what look what we've accomplished and it will be all ruined if we fail in, in not upholding the nation. So the Cincinnati comes into being and their state and there their are, are national organizations and it's attacked for being aristocratic of trying to instill a new aristocracy, potentially a new monarchy even in America. And the Cincinnati uh, defends itself saying, you know, who would be this Caesar? Who would be this this malevolent king? 
Washington, the man who retired, gave up power. They said it's not, there's no special status in, in, um, the nation. They're not, it is not like a house of lords. They're not given special privileges. And there's a real debate back and forth. And this is what really gets Franklin thinking about his idea of ascending honor again. And he hasn't really talked about it since the 1720s, but he does in relation to the Cincinnati. And he starts referring again to this idea of ascending honor, that honor is due to the person who behaves well and the people who taught them. And it gets tied into sort of raising this new Republican generation. Roughly the same time, Thomas Jefferson also starts coming up with his own definition of honor. And he his is more internal. And it's not about the perceptions of others. It's about what you think and but he puts it in the terms of imagine the whole world we're watching so using this public component that's that's key in traditional honor but not being concerned with that but act as if so only do what you feel is is right so the the tension with the cincinnati dies down largely because they they prove themselves to be loyal during the the upcoming shays rebellion but this was a really glaring moment of of differences of what exactly it meant to be honorable. And both sides were saying, well, we're advancing what's best for the nation. And, and you see these elements in sort of modern politics today. So let's talk about the role of dueling, because dueling is like the most stereotypical honor thing is, right? A duel is a, an affair of honor. You highlight in the book that before the 19th century, there were actually very few duels in America. But then after the war, there's like dueling became this craze. So what was going on there? Why did dueling suddenly have this uptick right after the Revolutionary War? Okay, right. And you're right. Dueling is is the stereotype. You ask anyone about honor, that's it's gentlemen at 10 paces. And dueling is very uncommon. In fact, pr- prior to the revolution, uh, my numbers may be, may be off, so don't quote me. I think there were roughly 75 duels total in American history before the revolution. And after that, recorded duels i think there's roughly 700 plus but that's recorded so it, it's, it's who knows dueling picks up a little bit during the the revolution during the sort of middle years when american officers come in contact with european officers and it's very much a way for people try to you have many in the continental army they're trying to out gentlemen the gentlemen to prove they're of a certain status so it does happen a little bit among the officers in the revolution but it's something that's that's vehemently denounced in sort of orders of military conduct for the Continental Army. Washington is inherently opposed to it. Most people in American society view dueling as dishonorable. It's really, there's there's actually a newspaper from early 19th century that that says that really there's only a hundred people or so that support dueling. They're just really vocal about it. So Dueling is really not something that's embraced by the revolutionary generation. Obviously, the, the Hamilton Bird duel is, is, is famed, but that actually starts a, a real moment of a reaction, sort of an, of anti-dueling. Of uh, look at these two men. What else could they have given to their country? But they, the death of Hamilton, the the ruin of, of Burr. This is a, a tragedy for the nation that they could have served. They could have done more. And what if they cost not just themselves, but, but us? So the idea of, uh, of dueling as murderers, dueling as suicide as sort of inherently unethical. So why does it pick up? And it absolutely does pick up in the 19th century, but it doesn't pick up with the revolutionary generation. It picks up with their children and their grandchildren. Generations that have to sort of live up to the revolutionary fathers that don't have the same way to make their, to advance in the world. And they start going back to an older sense of honor, this idea of reputation, of valor, of proving their bravery. So they start to move away from sort of this ethical definition that exists during the revolution. And we see this really highlighted in, in the war of 1812, the idea of we have to defend national honor as defend personal honor and the best representation of this is andrew jackson and he's coming at it from this sort of older scots irish clan based honor tradition where his his mother has taught him that you never go to court for matters of assault you handle that personally and it's this new sense 
of honor, which is really an old sense of honor that starts to, to, to really change what we think of in, as the sort of stereotype of the antebellum Southern honor that builds into the Civil War. Yeah, Jackson, he was a character. He had like, I don't know how many bullets he had in him from all the duels he did. It's, it's reported that he, he's, he owned, it's re, again, there's no way to prove this and the numbers right. probably off. It's, it's alleged he fought a hundred duels in his life. That's probably not true, but he's, you know, he's used rocks. He's used fists. He's used pistols. He allegedly kept over 30 pistols at the ready in case he was challenged and needed to fight. So it was this, he really became a new sort of symbol of, of, you know, masculinity of democracy. And it's really playing on this older notion of honor, not the new revolutionary one. So I know you're, you specialize in the, the Revolutionary War, but when did we start seeing like a backlash against the, the sort of return to dueling? Was it the Civil War that kind of helped that or what happened there? Oh, yeah. The Civil, the civil War is, is, is crucial in sort of ending the traditional sort of honor culture. It's, and it's also why it also plays into the idea that, that honor was just sort of a, a Southern component and 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 it's your your former guest Laurie and foot talks about it that's not true there's is very much a it's an american co- concept that exists in the north and the south but the breakdown of sort of the plantation system is going to sort of reshape hierarchy where you have like the South sort of creating a sort of pseudo aristocracy, but it doesn't mean honor completely goes away. You see remnants of honor and sort of the American imperial moment. What's interesting is when, when, so when do we stop talking about honor? It's roughly the early 20th century round about world war one, give or take. And I've actually charted this using Google engrams where you can literally chart, you know, usages of words. And in the early 20th century, the word honorable goes down and there's a moment where literally honorable and ethical cross and the word honorable dies, but the word ethical grows. And there's really, in in my interpretation, it's that we're not changing these ideas. These ideas haven't gone away. We're just using new words for them. We're saying things are ethical rather than honorable. Yeah, and I, I think yeah, World War One probably. I mean, that was like the first real mechanized war. And uh, this, you know, that the whole disillusionment that happened after World War One. I. I mean, I think Hemingway has that quote that he says like, "Glory and honor and courage are just abstract words. They don't mean anything." Because I mean, he saw firsthand that, that World War One, at least, was not glorious or honorable. It was just death and carnage. It's a fundamental uh, change in sort of a, you know, a moment of modernity in, 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 in some respects, but that's, that's where I think the, the language really changes, but I don't think the, cu- the customs or the concepts go away. I mean, you recently had Tamla Summers on and, and he was talking about this idea of, you know, uh, why honor still matters. And, and I don't think it vanished. I just think we, we speak of it differently and that's why it gets forgotten. Well, Craig, this has been a great conversation. There's so much more we can talk about. Where can people go to learn more about the book and your work? Oh, well, thanks so much for having me. They can go to my website, craigbrucesmith.com, and the book's available at Amazon and, and other places. And if anyone has questions, feel free to shoot me an email. Fantastic. Well, Craig Bruce Smith, thank you so much for your time. It's been a pleasure. Oh, thanks for having me. My guest today was Craig Bruce Smith. He's the author of the book, American Honor. It's available on amazon.com. You can also find out more information about his work at craigbrucesmith.com. Also, check out our show notes at aom.is slash American Honor, where you can find links to resources where we can delve deeper into this topic.